Bismarck well understood the money changers' plan. Allegations that international bankers were responsible for Lincoln's assassination surfaced in Canada 70 years later in 1934. Gerald G. McGeer, a popular and well-respected Canadian attorney, revealed this stunning charge in a five-hour speech before the Canadian House of Commons, blasting Canada's debt-based money system. Remember, it was 1934, the height of the Great Depression, which was ravaging Canada as well. McGeer had obtained evidence deleted from the public record provided to him by Secret Service agents at the trial of John Wilkes Booth after Booth's death. McGeer said it showed that Booth was a mercenary working for the international bankers. According to an article in the Vancouver Sun of May 2nd, 1934, Abraham Lincoln, the martyred emancipator of the slaves, was assassinated through the machinations of a group representative of the international bankers who feared the United States president's national credit ambitions. There was only one group in the world at that time who had any reason to desire the death of Lincoln. They were the men opposed to his national currency program and who had fought him throughout the whole Civil War on his policy of greenback currency. Interestingly, McGeer claimed that Lincoln was assassinated not only because international bankers wanted to reestablish a central bank in America, but because they also wanted to base America's currency on gold, gold they controlled. In other words, put America on a gold standard. Lincoln had done just the opposite by issuing U.S. notes, greenbacks, which were based purely on the good faith and credit of the United States. The article quoted McGeer as saying, They were the men interested in the establishment of the gold standard and the right of the bankers to manage the currency and credit of every nation in the world. With Lincoln out of the way, they were able to proceed with that plan and did proceed with it in the United States. Within eight years after Lincoln's assassination, silver was demonetized and the gold standard money system set up in the United States. Not since Lincoln has the U.S. issued debt-free United States notes. These red sealed bills, which were issued in 1963, were not a new issue from President Kennedy, but merely the old greenbacks reissued year after year. In another act of folly and ignorance, the 1994 Regal Act actually authorized the replacement of Lincoln's greenbacks with debt-based notes. In other words, greenbacks were in circulation in the United States until 1994. Why was silver bad for the bankers and gold good? Simple, because silver was plentiful in the United States. It was very hard to control. Gold was, and always has been, scarce. Throughout history, it has been relatively easy to monopolize gold, but silver has historically been 15 times more plentiful. With Lincoln out of the way, the money changers' next objective was to gain complete control over America's money. This was no easy task. With the opening of the American West, silver had been discovered in huge quantities. On top of that, Lincoln's greenbacks were generally popular. Despite the European Central Bankers deliberate attacks on greenbacks, they continued to circulate in the United States, in fact, until a few years ago. According to historian W. Cleon Skousen, Right after the Civil War, there was considerable talk about reviving Lincoln's brief experiment with the constitutional monetary system. Had not the European Money Trust intervened, it would have no doubt become an established institution. It is clear that the concept of America printing her own debt-free money sent shockwaves throughout the European central banking elite. They watched with horror as Americans clamored for more greenbacks. They may have killed Lincoln, but support for his monetary ideas grew. On April 12, 1866, nearly one year to the day of Lincoln's assassination, Congress went to work at the bidding of the European central banking interests. It passed the Contraction Act, authorizing the Secretary of the Treasury to begin to retire some of the greenbacks in circulation and thereby contract 
the money supply. Authors Theodore R. Thorin and Richard F. Warner explained the results of the money contraction in their classic book on the subject, The Truth in Money Book. The hard times which occurred after the Civil War could have been avoided if the greenback legislation had continued as President Lincoln had intended. Instead, there were a series of money panics, what we call recessions, which put pressure on Congress to enact legislation to place the banking system under centralized control. Eventually, the Federal Reserve Act was passed on December 23rd, 1913. In other words, the money changers wanted two things, the reinstitution of a central bank under their exclusive control, and two, an American currency backed by gold. Their strategy was twofold. First of all, cause a series of panics to try to convince the American people that only centralized control of the money supply could provide economic stability. And secondly, remove so much money from the system that most Americans would be so desperately poor that they either wouldn't care or would be too weak to oppose the bankers. In 1866, there was $1.8 billion in currency in circulation in the United States, about $50.46 per capita. In 1867 alone, half a billion dollars, $500 million, was removed from the U.S. money supply. Ten years later, in 1876, America's money supply was reduced to only $600 million. In other words, two-thirds of America's money had been called in by the bankers. Only $14.60 per capita remained in circulation. Ten years later, the money supply had been reduced to only $400 million, even though the population had boomed. The result was that only $6.67 per capita remained in circulation, a 760% loss in buying power over 20 years. Today, economists try to sell the idea that recessions and depressions are a natural part of something they call the business cycle. The truth is, our money supply is manipulated now just as it was before and after the Civil War. How did this happen? How did money become so scarce? Simple. Bank loans were called in and no new ones were given. In addition, silver coins were melted down. In 1872, a man named Ernest Said was given 100,000 pounds, about $500,000, by the Bank of England and sent to America to bribe necessary congressmen to get silver demonetized. He was told that if that was not sufficient, to draw an additional 100,000 pounds or as much more as was necessary. The next year, Congress passed the Coinage Act of 1873, and the minting of silver dollars abruptly stopped. In fact, Representative Samuel Hooper, who introduced the bill in the House, acknowledged that Mr. Said actually drafted the legislation. But it gets even worse than that. In 1874, Said himself admitted who was behind the scheme. I went to America in the winter of 1872-73, authorized to secure, if I could, the passage of a bill demonetizing silver. It was in the interest of those I represented, the governors of the Bank of England, to have it done. By 1873, gold coins were the only form of coin money. But the contest over control of America's money was not yet over. Only three years later, in 1876, with one-third of America's workforce unemployed, the population was growing restless. People were clamoring for a return to the greenback money system of President Lincoln or a return to silver money, anything that would make money more plentiful. That year, Congress created the United States Silver Commission to study the problem. Their report clearly blamed the monetary contraction on the national bankers. The report is interesting because it compares the deliberate money contraction by the national bankers after the Civil War to the fall of the Roman Empire. 
The disaster of the Dark Ages was caused by decreasing money and falling prices. Without money, civilization could not have had a beginning. And with a diminishing supply, it must languish, and unless relieved, finally perish. At the Christian era, the metallic money of the Roman Empire amounted to $1,800,000,000. By the end of the 15th century, it had shrunk to less than $200 million. History records no other such disastrous transition as that from the Roman Empire to the Dark Ages. Despite this report by the Silver Commission, Congress took no action. The next year, 1877, riots broke out from Pittsburgh to Chicago. The torches of starving vandals lit up the sky. The bankers huddled to decide what to do. They decided to hang on. Now that they were back in control to a certain extent, they were not about to give it up. At the meeting of the American Bankers Association that year, they urged their membership to do everything in their power to put down the notion of a return to greenbacks. The ABA secretary, James Buell, authored a letter to the members which blatantly called on the banks to subvert not only Congress, but the press. It is advisable to do all in your power to sustain such prominent daily and weekly newspapers, especially the agricultural and religious press, as will oppose the greenback issue of paper money, and that you will also withhold patronage from all applicants who are not willing to oppose the government issue of money. To repeal the act creating banknotes or to restore to circulation the government issue of money will be to provide the people with money and will therefore seriously affect our individual profits as bankers and lenders. See your congressman at once and engage him to support our interests that we may control legislation. As political pressure mounted in Congress for change, the press tried to turn the American people away from the truth. The New York Tribune put it this way on January 10th, 1878. The capital of the country is organized at last, and we will see whether Congress will dare to fly in its face. But it didn't work entirely. On February 28, 1878, Congress passed the Sherman Law, allowing the minting of a limited number of silver dollars, ending the five-year hiatus. This did not end gold backing of the currency, however, nor did it completely free silver. Previous to 1873, anyone who brought silver to the U.S. Mint could have it struck into silver dollars free of charge. No longer. But at least some money began to flow back into the economy again. With no further threat to their control, the bankers loosened up on loans, and the post-Civil War Depression was finally ended. Three years later, the American people elected Republican James Garfield president. Garfield understood how the economy was being manipulated. As a congressman, he had been chairman of the Appropriations Committee and was a member of Banking and Currency. After his inauguration, he slammed the money changers publicly in 1881. Whoever controls the volume of money in any country is absolute master of all industry and commerce. And when you realize that the entire system is very easily controlled, one way or another, by a few powerful men at the top, you will not have to be told how periods of inflation and depression originate. Unfortunately, within a few weeks of making this statement, on July 2nd of 1881, President Garfield was assassinated. The money changers were gathering strength fast. They began a periodic fleecing of the flock, as they called it, by creating economic booms followed by further depressions so they could buy up thousands of homes and farms for pennies on the dollar. In 1891, the money changers prepared to take the American economy down again, and their methods and motives were laid out with shocking clarity in a memo sent out by the American Bankers Association, the ABA, an organization in which most bankers were members. Notice that this memo called for bankers to create a depression on a certain date three years in the future. According to the congressional record, Here's how it read in part.
On September 1, 1894, we will not renew our loans under any consideration. On September 1st, we will demand our money. We will foreclose and become mortgagees in possession. We can take two-thirds of the farms west of the Mississippi and thousands of them east of the Mississippi as well at our price. Then the farmers will become tenants, as in England. These depressions could be controlled because America was on the gold money standard. Since gold is scarce, it's one of the easiest commodities to manipulate. People wanted silver money legalized again so they could escape the stranglehold the money changers had on gold money. People wanted silver money reinstated, reversing Mr. Said's Act of 1873, by then called the Crime of 73. By 1896, the issue of more silver money had become the central issue in the presidential campaign. William Jennings Bryan, a senator from Nebraska, ran for president as a Democrat on the free silver issue. At the Democratic National Convention in Chicago, he made an emotional speech which won him the nomination entitled Crown of Thorns and Cross of Gold. Though Bryan was only 36 years old at the time, this speech is widely regarded as the most famous oration ever made before a political convention. In the dramatic conclusion, Bryan said, We will answer their demand for our gold standard by saying to them, You shall not press down upon the brow of labor this crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. The bankers lavishly supported the Republican candidate, William McKinley, who favored the gold standard. The resulting contest was amongst the most fiercely contested presidential races in American history. Bryan made over 600 speeches in 27 states. The McKinley campaign got manufacturers and industrialists to inform their employees that if Bryan were elected, all factories and plants would close and there would be no work. The ruse succeeded. McKinley beat Bryan by a small margin. Bryan ran for president again in 1900 and in 1908, but fell short each time. During the 1912 Democratic Convention, Bryan was a powerful figure who helped Woodrow Wilson win the nomination. When Wilson became president, he appointed Bryan as Secretary of State, but Bryan soon became disenchanted with the Wilson administration. Bryan served only two years in the Wilson administration before resigning in 1915 over the highly suspicious sinking of the Lusitania, the event which was used to drive America into World War I. Although William Jennings Bryan never gained the presidency, his efforts delayed the money changers for 17 years from attaining their next goal, a new privately owned central bank for America. Now it was time for the money changers to get back to the business of a new private central bank for America. During the early 1900s, men like J.P. Morgan led the charge. One final panic would be necessary to focus the nation's attention on the supposed need for a central bank. The rationale was that only a central bank can be prevent bank failures. Morgan was clearly the most powerful banker in America and a suspected agent for the Rothschilds. Morgan had helped finance John D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil Empire. He had also helped finance the monopolies of Edward Harriman in railroads, of Andrew Carnegie in steel, and of others in numerous industries. But on top of that, J.P. Morgan's father, Junius Morgan, had been America's financial agent to the British. After his father's death, J.P. Morgan took on a British partner, Edward Grenfell, a longtime director of the Bank of England. In fact, upon Morgan's death, his estate contained only a few million dollars. The bulk of the securities most people thought he owned were, in fact, owned by others. In 1902, President Theodore Roosevelt allegedly went after Morgan and his friends by using the Sherman Antitrust Act to try to break up their industrial monopolies. Actually, Roosevelt did very little to interfere in the growing monopolization of American industry by the bankers and their surrogates.
For example, Roosevelt supposedly broke up the standard oil monopoly, but it wasn't really broken at all. It was merely divided into seven corporations, all still controlled by the Rockefellers. The public was aware of this thanks to political cartoonists like Thomas Nast, who referred to the bankers as the Money Trust. By 1907, the year after Teddy Roosevelt's re-election, Morgan decided it was time to try for a central bank again. Using their combined financial muscle, Morgan and his friends were secretly able to crash the stock market. Thousands of small banks were vastly overextended. Some had reserves of less than 1% thanks to the fractional reserve principle. Within days, bank runs were commonplace across the nation. Now Morgan stepped into the public arena and offered to prop up the faltering American economy by supporting failing banks with money he manufactured out of nothing. It was an outrageous proposal, far worse than even fractional reserve banking, but Congress let him do it. Morgan manufactured $200 million worth of this completely reserveless private money and bought things with it, paid for services with it, and sent some of it to his branch banks to lend out at interest. His plan worked. Soon, the public regained confidence in money in general and quit hoarding their currency. But as a result, banking power was further consolidated into the hands of a few large banks. By 1908, the panic was over, and Morgan was hailed as a hero by the president of Princeton University, a man by the name of Woodrow Wilson. All this trouble could be averted if we appointed a committee of six or seven public-spirited men like J.P. Morgan to handle the affairs of our country. Economics textbooks would later explain that the creation of the Federal Reserve System was the direct result of the Panic of 1907, quote, with its alarming epidemic of bank failures, the country was fed up once and for all with the anarchy of unstable private banking, close quote. But Minnesota Congressman Charles A. Lindbergh, Sr., the father of the famous aviator Lucky Lindy, later explained that the Panic of 1907 was really just a scam. Those not favorable to the money trust could be squeezed out of business and the people frightened into demanding changes in the banking and currency laws which the money trust would frame. So, since the passage of the National Bank Act of 1863, the money changers had been able to create a series of booms and busts. The purpose was not only to fleece the American public of their property, but to later claim that the banking system was basically so unstable that it had to be consolidated into a central bank once again. After the crash, Teddy Roosevelt, in response to the Panic of 1907, signed into law a bill creating something called the National Monetary Commission. The commission was to study the banking problem and make recommendations to Congress. Of course, the commission was packed with Morgan's friends and cronies. The chairman was a man named Senator Nelson Aldrich from Rhode Island. Aldrich represented the Newport, Rhode Island homes of America's richest banking families. His daughter married John D. Rockefeller, Jr., and together they had five sons, John, Nelson, who would become vice president in 1974, Lawrence, Winthrop and David, the head of the Council on Foreign Relations and former chairman of Chase Manhattan Bank. As soon as the National Monetary Commission was set up, Senator Aldrich immediately embarked on a two-year tour of Europe, where he consulted at length with the private central bankers in England, France, and Germany. The total cost of his trip alone to the taxpayers was $300,000, an astronomical sum in those days. Shortly after his return on the evening of November 22, 1910, some of the wealthiest and most powerful men in America boarded Senator Aldrich's private rail car and in the strictest secrecy journeyed to this place, Jekyll Island, off the coast of Georgia. With the group came Paul Warburg, Warburg had been given a $500,000 per year salary 
to lobby for the passage of a privately owned central bank in America by the investment firm Kuhn, Loeb & Company. Warburg's partner in this firm was a man named Jacob Schiff, the grandson of the man who shared the Greenshield house with the Rothschild family in Frankfurt. Schiff, as we'll find out later, was in the process of spending $20 million to finance the overthrow of the Tsar in Russia. These three European banking families, the Rothschilds, the Warburgs, and the Schiffs, were interconnected by marriage down through the years, just as their American banking counterparts, the Morgans, Rockefellers, and Aldriches were. Secrecy was so tight that all seven primary participants were cautioned to use only first names to prevent servants from learning their identities. Years later, one participant, Frank Vanderlip, president of National City Bank of New York and a representative of the Rockefeller family, confirmed the Jekyll Island trip in a February 9th, 1935 edition of the Saturday Evening Post. I was a secretive Indeed, as furtive as any conspirator, discovery we knew simply must not happen, or else all our time and effort would be wasted. If it were to be exposed that our particular group had got together and written a banking bill, that bill would have no chance whatever of passage by Congress. The participants came here to figure out how to solve their major problem, how to bring back a privately owned central bank. But there were other problems that needed to be addressed as well. First of all, the market share of the big national banks was shrinking fast. In the first 10 years of the century, the number of U.S. banks had more than doubled to over 20,000. By 1913, only 29% of all banks were national banks, and they held only 57% of all deposits. As Senator Aldrich later admitted in a magazine article. Before passage of this act, the New York bankers could only dominate the reserves of New York. Now, we are able to dominate the bank reserves of the entire country. Therefore, something had to be done to bring these new banks under their control. As John D. Rockefeller put it, quote, competition is sin, close quote. Secondly, the nation's economy was so strong that corporations were starting to finance their expansions out of profits instead of taking out huge loans from large banks. In the first 10 years of the new century, 70% of corporate funding came from profits. In other words, American industry was becoming independent of the money changers, and that trend had to be stopped. All the participants knew that these problems could be hammered out into a workable solution. But perhaps their biggest problem was a public relations problem, the name of the new bank. That discussion took place right here in this room, one of the many conference rooms in this sprawling hotel, today known as the Jekyll Island Club Hotel. Aldrich believed that the word bank should not even appear in the name. Warburg wanted to call the legislation the National Reserve Bill or the Federal Reserve Bill. The idea here was to give the impression that the purpose of the new central bank was to stop bank runs, but also to conceal its monopoly character. However, it was Aldrich, the egotistical politician, who insisted it be called the Aldrich Bill. After nine days at Jekyll Island, the group dispersed. The new central bank would be very similar to the old bank of the United States. It would be given a monopoly over U.S. currency and create that money out of nothing. How does the Fed create money out of nothing? It's a four-step process. But first, a word on bonds. Bonds are simply promises to pay or government IOUs. People buy bonds to get a secure rate of interest. At the end of the term of the bond, the government repays the bond plus interest, and the bond is destroyed. There are about $3.6 trillion worth of these loans or bonds at present. Now here is the Fed money-making process. Step one, the Federal Open Market Committee approves the purchase of U.S. bonds on the open market. Step two, 
the bonds are purchased by the fed from whoever is offering them for sale on the open market step three the fed pays for the bonds with electronic credits to the seller's bank which in turn credits the seller's bank account the trick is that these credits are based on nothing the fed just creates them step four the banks use these deposits as reserves they can loan out over ten times the amount of their reserves to new borrowers all at interest in this way a fed purchase of say a million dollars worth of bonds gets turned into over ten million dollars in bank accounts the fed in effect creates ten percent of this totally new money and the banks create the other ninety percent to reduce the amount of money in the economy the process is just reversed the fed sells bonds to the public and the money flows out of the purchasers local bank loans must be reduced by ten times the amount of the sale so a fed sale of a million dollars in bonds results in ten million dollars less money in the economy so how does this benefit the bankers whose representatives huddled at jekyll island first it totally misdirected banking reform efforts from proper solutions second it prevented a proper debt-free system of government finance like lincoln's greenbacks from making a comeback the bond-based system of government finance forced on lincoln after he created greenbacks was now cast in stone third it delegated to the bankers the right to create ninety percent of our money supply based on only fractional reserves which they then loan out at interest fourth it centralized overall control of our nation's money supply in the hands of a few men. Fifth, it established a central bank with a high degree of independence from effective political control. Soon after its creation, the Fed's great contraction in the early 1930s would cause the Great Depression. This independence has been enhanced since then through additional laws. In order to fool the public into thinking the government retained control, the plan called for the Fed to be run by a board of governors appointed by the president and approved by the Senate. But all the bankers had to do was to be sure their men got appointed to the board of governors. That wasn't hard. Bankers have money, and money buys influence over politicians. Once the participants left Jekyll Island, the public relations blitz was on. The big New York banks put together an educational fund of five million dollars to finance professors at respected universities to endorse the new bank. Woodrow Wilson at Princeton was one of the first to jump on the bandwagon. But the bankers' subterfuge didn't work. The Aldrich bill was quickly identified as the banker's bill, a bill to benefit only what became known as the money trust. As Congressman Lindbergh put it, during the congressional debate. The Aldrich plan is the Wall Street plan. It means another panic, if necessary, to intimidate the people. Aldrich, paid by the government to represent the people, proposes a plan for the trusts instead. Seeing they didn't have the votes to win in Congress, the Republican leadership never brought the Aldrich bill to a vote. The bankers quietly decided to move to track two, the Democratic alternative. They begin financing Woodrow Wilson as the Democratic nominee. As respected historian James Perloff put it, Wall Street financier Bernard Baruch was put in charge of Wilson's education. Baruch brought Wilson to the Democratic Party headquarters in New York in 1912, leading him like one would a poodle on a string. Wilson received an indoctrination course from the leaders convened there. So now the stage was set. The money changers were poised to install their privately owned central bank once again. The damage President Andrew Jackson had done 76 years earlier had been only partly repaired with the passage of the National Bank Act during the Civil War. Since then, the battle had raged on across the decades. The Jacksonians became the Greenbackers, who became the hardcore supporters of William Jennings Bryan. With Bryan leading the charge, these opponents of the money changers, ignorant of Baruch's tutelage, now threw themselves behind Democrat Woodrow Wilson. They and Bryan would soon be betrayed. 
During the presidential campaign, the Democrats were careful to pretend to oppose the Aldrich bill. As Representative Lewis McFadden, himself a Democrat, as well as chairman of the House Banking and Currency Committee, explained it 20 years after the fact. The Aldrich bill was condemned in the platform. When Woodrow Wilson was nominated, the men who ruled the Democratic Party promised the people that if they were returned to power, there would be no central bank established here while they held the reins of government. Thirteen months later, that promise was broken, and the Wilson administration, under the tutelage of those sinister Wall Street figures who stood behind Colonel House, established here in our free country the worm-eaten, monarchical institution of the King's Bank to control us from the top downward and to shackle us from the cradle to the grave. Once Wilson was elected, Morgan, Warburg, Baruch, and company advanced a new plan, which Warburg named the Federal Reserve System. The Democratic leadership hailed the new bill, called the Glass-Owen Bill, as something radically different from the Aldrich Bill. But in fact, the bill was virtually identical in every important detail. In fact, so vehement were the Democratic denials of similarity that Paul Warburg, the father of both bills, had to step in to reassure his paid friends in Congress that the two bills were virtually identical. Brushing aside the external differences affecting the shells, we find the kernels of the two systems very closely resembling and related to one another. But that admission was for private consumption only. Publicly, the money trust trotted out Senator Aldrich and Frank Vanderlip, the president of Rockefeller's National City Bank of New York and one of the Jekyll Island Seven, to oppose the new Federal Reserve System. Years later, however, Vanderlip admitted in the Saturday Evening Post that the two measures were virtually identical. Although the Aldrich Federal Reserve Plan was defeated when it bore the name Aldrich, nevertheless, its essential points were all contained in the plan that finally was adopted. As Congress neared a vote, they called Ohio attorney Alfred Crozier to testify. Crozier noted the similarities between the Aldrich bill and the Glass-Owen bill. The bill grants just what Wall Street and the big banks for 25 years have been striving for, private instead of public control of currency. It the Glass-Owen bill does this as completely as the Aldrich bill. Both measures rob the government and the people of all effective control over the public's money and vest in the banks exclusively the dangerous power to make money among the people scarce or plenty. During the debate on the measure, senators complained that the big banks were using their financial muscle to influence the outcome. There are bankers in this country who are enemies of the public welfare, said one senator. What an understatement. Despite the charges of deceit and corruption, the bill was finally snuck through the Senate on December 22, 1913, after most senators had left town for the holidays, after having been assured by the leadership that nothing would be done until long after the Christmas recess. On the day the bill was passed, Congressman Lindbergh prophetically warned his countrymen that this act establishes the most gigantic trust on earth. When the president signs this bill, the invisible government by the monetary power will be legalized. The people may not know it immediately, but the day of reckoning is only a few years removed. The worst legislative crime of the ages is perpetrated by this banking bill. On top of all this, only weeks earlier, Congress had finally passed a bill legalizing income tax. Why was the income tax law important? Because bankers finally had in place a system which would run up a virtually unlimited federal debt. How would the interest on this debt be repaid, never mind the principal? Remember, a privately owned central bank creates the principal out of nothing. The federal government was small then. Up to then, it had subsisted merely on tariffs and excise taxes. No, just as with the Bank of England, the interest payments had to be guaranteed by direct taxation of the people. 
the money changers knew that if they had to rely on contributions from the states, eventually the individual state legislatures would revolt and either refuse to pay the interest on their own money or at least bring political pressure to bear to keep the debt small. It is interesting to note that in 1895, the Supreme Court had found a similar income tax law to be unconstitutional. The Supreme Court even found a corporate income tax law unconstitutional in 1909. As a result, Senator Aldrich hustled a bill for a constitutional amendment allowing income tax through the Congress. The proposed 16th Amendment to the Constitution was then sent to the state legislatures for approval. But some critics claim that the 16th Amendment was never ratified by the necessary three quarters of the states. In other words, the 16th Amendment may not be legal. But the money changers were in no mood to debate the fine points. By October of 1913, Senator Aldrich had hustled the income tax bill through Congress. Without the power to tax the people directly and bypass the states, the Federal Reserve Bill would be far less useful to those who wanted to drive America deeply into their debt. A year after the passage of the Federal Reserve Bill, Congressman Lindbergh explained how the Fed created what we have come to call the business cycle and how they use it to their advantage. To cause high prices, all the Federal Reserve Board will do will be to lower the rediscount rate producing an expansion of credit and a rising stock market. Then, when businessmen are adjusted to these conditions, it can check prosperity in mid-career by arbitrarily raising the rate of interest. It can cause the pendulum of a rising and falling market to swing gently back and forth by slight changes in the discount rate, or cause violent fluctuations by a greater rate variation. And in either case, it will possess inside information as to financial conditions and advanced knowledge of the coming change, either up or down. This is the strangest, most dangerous advantage ever placed in the hands of a special privileged class by any government that ever existed. The system is private, conducted for the sole purpose of obtaining the greatest possible profits from the use of other people's money. They know in advance when to create panics to their advantage. They also know when to stop panic. Inflation and deflation work equally well for them when they control finance. Congressman Lindbergh was correct on all points. What he didn't realize was that most European nations had already fallen prey to the central bankers decades or centuries earlier. But he also mentions the interesting fact that only one year later, the Fed had cornered the market in gold. This is how he put it, quote, already the Federal Reserve Banks have cornered the gold and gold certificates, close quote. But Congressman Lindbergh was not the only critic of the Fed. Congressman Lewis McFadden, the chairman of the House Banking and Currency Committee from 1920 to 1931, remarked that the Federal Reserve Act brought about a super state controlled by international bankers and international industrialists acting together to enslave the world for their own pleasure. Notice how McFadden saw the international character of the stockholders of the Federal Reserve. Another chairman of the House Banking and Currency Committee in the 1960s, Wright Patman from Texas, put it this way. In the United States today, we have in effect two governments. We have the duly constituted government. Then we have an independent, uncontrolled, and uncoordinated government in the Federal Reserve System, operating the money powers, which are reserved to Congress by the Constitution. Even the inventor of the electric light, Thomas Edison, joined the fray in criticizing the system of the Federal Reserve. If our nation can issue a dollar bond, it can issue a dollar bill. The element that makes the bond good makes the bill good also. The difference between the bond and the bill is the bond lets money brokers collect twice the amount of the bond and an additional 20%, whereas the currency pays nobody but those who contribute directly in some useful way. It is absurd to say that our country can issue $30 million in bonds and not $30 million in currency. Both are promises to pay, but one promise 
fattens the usurers, and the other helps the people. Three years after the passage of the Federal Reserve Act, even President Wilson began to have second thoughts about what had been unleashed during his first term in office. We have come to be one of the worst ruled, one of the most completely controlled governments in the civilized world, no longer a government of free opinion, no longer a government by a vote of the majority, but a government by the opinion and duress of a small group of dominant men. Some of the biggest men in the United States in the field of commerce and manufacture are afraid of something. They know that there is a power somewhere so organized, so subtle, so watchful, so interlocked, so complete, so pervasive, that they had better not speak above their breath when they speak in condemnation of it. Before his death in 1924, President Wilson realized the full extent of the damage he had done to America when he confessed, I have unwittingly ruined my government. So finally, the money changers, those who profit by manipulating the amount of money in circulation, had their privately owned central bank installed again in America. The major newspapers, which they also owned, hailed passage of the Federal Reserve Act of 1913, telling the public that now depressions could be scientifically prevented. The fact of the matter was that now depressions could be scientifically created. Power was now centralized to a tremendous extent. Now it was time for a war, a really big war. In fact, the first world war. Of course, to the central bankers, the political issues of war don't matter nearly as much as the profit potential, and nothing creates debts like warfare. England was the best example at that time. During the 119-year period between the founding of the Bank of England and Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo, England had been at war for 56 years, and much of the remaining time she'd been preparing for war. In World War I, the German Rothschilds loaned money to the Germans, the British Rothschilds loaned money to the British, and the French Rothschilds loaned money to the French. In America, J.P. Morgan was the sales agent for war materials to both the British and the French. In fact, six months into the war, Morgan became the largest consumer on earth, spending $10 million a day. His offices here at 23 Wall Street were mobbed by brokers and salesmen trying to cut a deal. In fact, it got so bad that the bank had to post guards at every door and at the partners' homes as well. Many other New York bankers made out as well from the war. President Wilson appointed Bernard Baruch to head the War Industries Board. According to historian James Perloff, both Baruch and the Rockefellers profited by some $200 million during the war. But profits were not the only motive. There was also revenge. The money changers never forgave the czars for their support of Lincoln during the Civil War. Also, Russia was the last major European nation to refuse to give in to the privately owned central bank scheme. Three years after World War I broke out, the Russian Revolution toppled the czar and installed the scourge of communism. Jacob Schiff of Kuhn Loeb and Company bragged from his deathbed that he had spent $20 million towards the defeat of the Tsar. Money was funneled from England to support the revolution as well. Why would some of the richest men in the world financially back communism, the system that was openly vowing to destroy the so-called capitalism that made them wealthy? Researcher Gary Allen explained it this way. If one understands that socialism is not a share of the wealth program, but is in reality a method to consolidate and control the wealth, then the seeming paradox of super rich men promoting socialism becomes no paradox at all. Instead, it becomes logical, even the perfect tool of power-seeking megalomaniacs. Communism, or more accurately, socialism, is not a movement of the downtrodden masses but of the economic elite. As W. Cleon Skousen put it, 
In his 1970 book, The Naked Capitalist, Power from any source tends to create an appetite for additional power. It was almost inevitable that the super-rich would one day aspire to control not only their own wealth, but the wealth of the whole world. To achieve this, they were perfectly willing to feed the ambitions of the power-hungry political conspirators who were committed to the overthrow of all existing governments and the establishments of a central worldwide dictatorship. But what if these revolutionaries get out of control and try to seize power from the super-rich? After all, it was Mao Zedong who in 1938 stated his position concerning power. Political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. The Wall Street, London Axis elected to take the risk. The master planners attempted to control revolutionary communist groups by feeding them vast quantities of money when they obeyed and contracting their money supply or even financing their opposition if they got out of control. Lenin began to understand that although he was the absolute dictator of the new Soviet Union, he was not pulling the financial strings. Someone else was silently in control. The state does not function as we desired. The car does not obey. A man is at the wheel and seems to lead it, but the car does not drive in the desired direction. It moves as another force wishes. Who is behind it? Representative Lewis T. McFadden, the chairman of the House Banking and Currency Committee throughout the 1920s and into the Great Depression years of the 1930s, explained it this way. The course of Russian history has indeed been greatly affected by the operations of international bankers. The Soviet government has been given United States Treasury funds by the Federal Reserve Board, acting through the Chase Bank. England has drawn money from us through the Federal Reserve Banks and has relent it at high rates of interest to the Soviet government. The Dnipsatory Dam was built with funds unlawfully taken from the United States Treasury by the corrupt and dishonest Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve Banks. In other words, the Fed and the Bank of England, at the behest of the international bankers who controlled them, were creating a monster, one which would fuel seven decades of unprecedented communist revolution, warfare, and most importantly, debt. In case you think there's some chance that the money changers got communism going and then lost control, in 1992, the Washington Times reported that Russian President Boris Yeltsin was upset that most of the incoming foreign aid was being siphoned off, quote, straight back into the coffers of Western banks in debt service, close quote. No one in his right mind would claim that a war as large as World War I had a single cause. Wars are complex things with many causative factors. But on the other hand, it would also be equally foolish to ignore as a prime cause of World War I those who would profit the most from the war. The role of the money changers is no wild conspiracy theory. They had a motive, a short-ranged, self-serving motive, as well as a long-range political motive of advancing totalitarian governments with the money changers maintaining the financial clout to control whatever politician might emerge as the leader. Next, we'll see what the money changers' ultimate political goal is for the world. Shortly after World War I, the overall political agenda of the money changers began to be clear. Now that they controlled national economies individually, the next step was the ultimate form of consolidation, world government. The new world government proposal was given top priority at the Paris Peace Conference after World War I. It was called the League of Nations. But much to the surprise of Paul Warburg and Bernard Baruch, who attended the peace conference with President Wilson, the world was not yet ready to dissolve national boundaries. Nationalism still beats strong in the human breast. For example, Lord Curzon, the British Foreign Secretary, called the League of Nations a good joke, even though it was the stated policy of the British government to support it. To the humiliation of President Wilson, the U.S. Congress wouldn't ratify the League either.
despite the fact that it had been ratified by many other nations, without money flowing from the U.S. Treasury, the League died.